All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. And I see many familiar faces that have joined us um, for past presentations. Happy to see you again. And I do see some new faces. So you're joining us for the first time. Uh, welcome. So as most of you know, and for those of you who don't, RDW and iFactory were committed um, to the way that we think about and respond to, surround, to issues surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as you guys know, accessibility is a critical part of that. So what does that mean? So that means means if people are low vision, blind, or deaf and blind, they have equal access to online information and services, which is obviously very important for us in our industry as most of what we do is online. So our speaker today has worked with the Perkins School for the Blind, Helen Keller Services, Hadley, and the Braille Institute. So without further drum roll, I am happy to introduce my colleague, Jeremy Perkins, who is the Director of UX and Design at iFactory for our Boston division. Thank you, Jeremy, and welcome. Thanks, Martha. Happy to be here. Um, really excited to talk about this topic. I spent a lot of time thinking about how uh, websites and interfaces can serve everybody. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and make sure that you can see that. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. I just want to double check if I go into this mode, can you still see it? All right. Yes. Excellent. Great. Okay. So um, today we're going to chat about web accessibility. And there are three parts to this. Uh, it's, it's really an overview for those who know very little about the topic or are familiar with it. This I, There'll be something for everyone in this. We're going to talk a little bit about what, what web accessibility is and why it matters, then go into how people access websites and some of the problems that can arise around that. And then we'll go into uh, the standards, tools, and testing methods to achieve accessibility on a website. There are really two sides to this. There's the human side to this, and then there's the technical side to this. And that's really what my background is. So I'm a, a graphic designer by training. I've spent my entire career thinking about digital interfaces. Um, so I cross into user experience, which is the human side of the, the equation, as well as front end development, which is the technology. So um, really, I'm thinking about all sides to this equation, how people experience things, the problems and pain points they might run into, and what are the solutions we can implement to ensure that they have a great experience. So um, at iFactory, we, um, we do a variety of services, including web accessibility, everything from strategy and discovery to user experience to content strategy, governance, SEO, web and product design, custom development, really the whole spectrum of everything that goes into creating a great experience. And everything we do, we try to infuse web accessible thinking into our process from design to UX to, to development. So as Martha mentioned, you know, most of my knowledge uh, around this topic has come from specific uh, organizations that we worked with over the years that uh, specifically serve users who have a disability. Um, and that really kind of opened my eyes, you know, metaphorically to um, the kind of struggle that can be experienced by somebody. You could encounter a website as a fully abled person and think it's an incredible ex user experience, but under the hood, on another level, somebody else could be having a terrible experience and it won't be obvious just using the website that that's the case. So there's other dimensions to a web experience than just the visual layer that we that most of us encounter who have uh, are fully abled in our eyesight. So these organizations really gave me an education along with my work for them on, on what it takes to really serve those with specific needs. So um, diversity, equity, and inclusion overlaps with accessibility. I consider it to be a part of the same uh, objective. There are a number of you know, uh, abbreviations out there that have been introduced to include accessibility in DEI. There's DEIA that appends accessibility as one of, you know, one of four uh, things. There's DEIB where uh, you may consider equity to be a part, the accessibility to be a part of equity in that inclusion uh, statement with belonging added as well. 
Um, I've seen at least once uh, the letters being rearranged to be idea instead, but the idea really is the same thing. It's that we're trying to uh, make sure that everyone, regardless of their background, preferences, or abilities, is included in what we create. Uh, the spirit remains the same. Um, so uh, let's start with what is accessibility. So um, there's many definitions out there. I try to come up with a, a starting point that feels as simple and connected to uh, what it feels like to use something as possible. So making an experience usable and enjoyable for everyone is one way of putting it. The usable side of it is making sure that people don't have a don't fail, right? You want them to be able to use something at, as a baseline. But we try to go beyond that. We want people to have an enjoyable experience. We want to make sure that they not only can get through something, accomplish a task, but feel like well served, feel thrilled, like delighted, like they it, this was made for them. So that's really what we strive for. And, and the key key word here is also everyone. We don't want anyone to be left out. Um, we want to create something that that meets everyone's needs. So uh, who needs accessible sites? Uh, the main group of people that we're thinking of are people who have a disability. Um, and the abilities that are affected by web usage are typically people who are blind, deaf, deaf blind, colorblind, who have low vision, are hard of hearing, who have a cognitive or learning disability, a motor or dexterity disability, or who are prone to seizures. These are, the, these are the disabilities that primarily affect web usage. So these are the ones we're gonna be targeting as we look for solutions. Also, um, you know, your parents and grandparents need accessible sites. Uh, the abilities that are in decline for people as they age, are the, it's the same list largely as those who maybe are born with a disability or who develop a disability at a younger age. So these same uh, mostly sensory abilities uh, are in decline as people age. And so really there's a lot of overlap there. It's not just those who have a disability, but also older adults who are looking to access the, the same uh, experiences as the rest of us. You know, just projections uh, through 2030, we may, we're likely to see that over 20% of the population will be age 65 plus. So it's a, it's a growing portion of the population that we wanna make sure has a great experience as they age. One of the uh, effects of, of getting older with eyesight is that contrast sensitivity declines. What this means is that the difference in lights and darks uh, becomes less pronounced. And so having a, a sufficiently high contrast interface to a website is important and it's one of the requirements for being accessible so that those with contrast sensitivity decreased um, can, can access and read text that's on the screen. One of the uh, great moments at one of our clients in the past was that we had the uh, opportunity to try on these goggles that were um, ways of simulating different visual uh, impairments different conditions. So some of these may have like one lens has like a little tiny hole that you can see through and not the entire field of vision. Others are obscured or, or, or fogged in some way so that it's the it's blurry or unclear, or there's a there's a color filter applied to one of the lenses to simulate color, you know, various color blindness. So th these are really, a really interesting way to step in the inside the shoes of somebody who has a different ability with sight than 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 I would, and to experience that um, that difference. So um, another group that needs accessible sites is all of us at at certain times. So there are temporary disabilities that we may experience, regardless of our age or ability or natural ability. We have, we may have a broken arm or have a repetitive stress injury where we're unable to use a mouse or a trackpad temporarily. We have to use a keyboard or some other device. Uh, we may you may lose your glasses and be unable to read small text uh, temporarily. There's also situational disabilities. So you might be out in bright sunlight with your phone trying to read on the screen and be un unable to read you know yellow text on a white background if some designer decided to do that. So high contrast matters in those situations. 
or you may be in a noisy room, a, a, a conference room with other people where you don't want to play audio, but you, you want to watch a quick video. So you might turn on the captions and read those captions, which are an accessibility benefit for those who can't hear as well. So there's a range of, of populations and people and situations uh, where accessibility is a benefit. So why does it matter to focus on this and devote effort to making sure that we're accessible? Well, three quick reasons. One is that we can feel good in knowing that we're helping people like these folks and others um, just live happy, productive lives and have access to the same opportunities that the rest of us have. The second one is that it's better business to be accessible. So um, just looking at census data, you know, roughly almost 20% of the population, uh, give or take a few percent, uh, has some kind of disability. And if you just take break out the disabilities that relate to using uh, websites on screen interfaces, you know, vision, hearing, fine motor skills, and learning. You're, you're looking at perhaps potentially almost 10% of the population who you could be leaving behind in your, your business or your organization's mission. And so that's, it's a side, it's more that people than you would think who have, um, may have a need for an accessible website. Also, you know, we, we all need it, as I mentioned, um, captioned video is one of the most widely used features by all people. Um, so having really good captions on videos uh, is important. Also voice browsing. So, uh, you know, using voice to control and search and do things is becoming more and more popular. And having an accessible website that can be uh, spidered and cataloged by search engines and other tools is really important. It also benefits search engine optim optimization. So having all of these things on your, your web experience, captions for videos, alternative text for images, proper page titles, headings. It provides a lot of semantic information about the content that you're providing that can then be picked up and interpreted and found through other modes such as voice, not just an on-screen presentation. Finally, it's the law. This is a few years ago. So we saw from about 2015 to 2020, a large increase in web accessibility related digital lawsuits filed in federal courts. Um, you know, an organization's website just wasn't accessible and it was blocking certain populations from accessing information. And so lawsuits were filed. We've seen the, the number continue to be this high, several thousand lawsuits per year since, since 2020. So it's a big deal. Um, large companies and other organizations across sectors have been the uh, target of, of certain lawsuits. Um, and they've largely had to settle and remediate their web properties in order to make them accessible as a result. So it's, it's, it's important. I would prefer to think about Reason number one and two, first, uh, we want to do this because we want to serve everyone, but there is a there are legal consequences to not doing it as well. So let's talk quickly about how sites are accessed. One of the terms that you may come across as you dig in and learn more about web accessibility is something called assistive technology. So assistive technology is a group of products, equipment, and systems that enhance learning, working, and daily living for persons with disabilities. So there's a, there's a set of tools that people who have a disability make use of to allow them to engage with websites um, and that's assistive technology. So um, I'm gonna break them, these assistive technologies into two groups. There are those that help us receive information and then there's those that help us input information. So receiving information, the most popular tool is a screen reader. Uh, which many of you have probably heard of. What a screen reader is, is a, it's a piece of software that runs on your device that works in conjunction with other applications, such as a web browser, to translate what's on screen into audio, into spoken audio. So I'm browsing a website, I'm looking at the page, it's translating the images, the text, the headings, the, the logo, the icons into speech that I can listen to. So many people who, people who are blind 
will be browsing the web on their laptop, let's say, and their screen is just off, it's dark, right? They're saving power and they're just listening to the website. And then they're moving around a page and navigating by listening to it. So popular screen readers for Windows are JAWS, uh, NVDA, and Narrator. Narrator is the one that comes with Windows. It's free. Uh, on Mac, it's VoiceOver and it's iOS as well. And then on Android, it's TalkBack. There's, there's a mode on, on every device that you own of, of these types where you can just turn on the screen reader and experience it if you wanted to. Uh, check it out. It's an it's a interesting uh, to become familiar with that. So another way of um, reading information from a screen is a refreshable braille display. So this is an accessory that users can attach to their laptop um, in conjunction with their keyboard and be able to run their fingers along a row of braille uh, dots that raise and lower. So it's a, it's a changeable line of, of braille text that somebody can read by touching it and they can experience um, the text that the screen reader is outputting by, by, do, by reading the braille. So the users who are deafblind, who um, can't see or hear, they would, instead of listening to the audio of the screen reader, could use a braille display and, and use their sensory uh, touch sense to uh, experience the, the information. Another tool is a screen magnifier. This is for people who have low vision, so they can see, but not well. What it does is it, it zooms the page way up to, you know, a thousand percent or more so that, you know, only a few words or even a few letters are showing at once. So that, you know, those who need, need text very enlarged beyond what the browser can do can uh, zoom way in. And then the, what they do is they, they pan around the page and for, in all directions to experience what else is there. So they'll go to the right, they'll go down. And what we found is when we design pages, the, the different axes in the layout, right? Like the left-hand uh, axis of the page is a critical path that somebody explores with a, with a screen magnifier going down the left side of the page to discover what sections are there. And so making certain layout decisions to make sure they can discover content in those spots becomes a, an important consideration. So for entering information, um, this is a little bit more familiar. Uh, hands are one way of entering information. We all have them, not everybody, but most of us. And those who are blind or low vision typically would use their hands. And the, the difference here is that um, if you are if you are blind, you can't track the position of a cursor on a two dimensional surface. So a keyboard or a touch screen is becomes the preferred way of interacting. So watching a, a mouse cursor move around on screen becomes uh, impossible for you. So uh, most screen reader users, what you'll see is that they are using a keyboard to move focus from element to element on a page, top to bottom. So it, it focuses on each piece of content and it announces what it is and it's moving sequentially from top to bottom. That's how um, a user who's blind would interact through a screen reader. Touch screens are amazing in that, you know, if you're holding it with a hand, if, even if you're not looking at it, you know what the boundaries of this rectangle are and you can slide your finger around on the screen and listen to what's under your, your finger or thumb at any one time. So a touch screen is highly usable by those with a, a visual disability. Um, there are other devices for those who can't make as much use of their hands or, um, or at all. So there's handheld controllers, there's switches that people can use to, to execute actions. There's also you know, mouth sticks and sip, sip and puff tubes for those who are you know, have full paralysis and can't use their hands. Uh, they can use their mouth or their breath in order to control a computer. And also just voice, again, is becoming extremely popular. If you can speak words, you can tell your device, your computer, what to do, to focus on something, to, to tell me what that is, to click that link, send that email. Um, that's becoming a, a really easy to use method. 
Also, those who are in a wheelchair may have a mounted display where their device gets affixed. And um, it often is difficult if they can't use their hands to rotate that device, that it's in one orientation only. So if you've got an iPad or an iPhone and it's in one orientation only, we don't want the site to only work in portrait or landscape mode. It's got to work in both because a user may only have access to one orientation. So that becomes important. So really all of these, um, all these scenarios to me are, there's, there's something that ties them all together. I try to think in terms of what's the common, um, the commonality among these. So really we're looking for ways to let people access the web in the way most comfortable to them. We're not trying to meet specific needs or address specific disabilities per se, but to just think about this as a, you know people have comfort levels some people listen to websites, some people look at websites, some people do both. There's people who actually listen and look together. So we wanna create something really that has maximum flexibility. So the most flexible possible experience we can create will ensure that the most people can access it in the way most comfortable to them. So how to become accessible. There are standards out there uh, that can that can tell us whether any website or experience is accessible or not. The gold standard out there is called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG for short. This is a set of um, guidelines that were written in a technology agnostic way. Um, they're testable statements with success criteria, so it's a pass-fail scoring system. And there's a variety of techniques that are offered that can be used to meet these criteria. So WCAG has been around a long time, over 20 years at this point. It's, uh, it's a sort of a, a group standards body based approach to defining what they, those are and writing them with input from a lot of organizations, a lot of accessibility experts. Um, and it has become the standard to follow. So WCAG is organized into four principles within which there's a number of guidelines. And then inside under those guidelines are the actual success criteria that we're most concerned with, where there's a pass fail scoring system. And then the techniques are tied to those success criteria. The four principles are perceivable which is that content, first of all, can be detected. If you can't detect that there's content there, you can't do anything with it. So this includes things such as making sure images and audio and video have alternative text, that there's sufficient contrast uh, in, for text and certain graphics so that you can see them and read them. Um, operable is content can be manipulated. So making sure that everything works with a keyboard as well as a pointer-based device input mode, um, as well as being able to control any motion that's on a screen to stop any movement, for example. Understandable is making sure content can be understood, so making sure that the language of the document is declared, making sure that forms behave in predictable ways, that if there's an error message that it can be detected and understood and a user can recover from that error. And robust is making sure that um, everything we create adheres to standards so that a variety of assistive technology can access it in a predictable way. So there are three conformance levels to WCAG, A, AA, and AAA. The AAA criteria are the most blue sky, like ideal situation, not always feasible to achieve those depending on the situation. On the other hand, A are must-haves. Everything has to do this in order to be have a baseline level of accessibility. So AA is considered to be the universal standard that all websites and apps need to adhere to in order to be deemed accessible. So AA is what is what to remember. Uh, one of the success criteria, um, just to give you a sense for what, how they're written and, and how they work, this is the very first one in WCAG. It's 1.1.1, non-text content. So you can see how it's written. All non-text content that is presented to the user has a text alternative that serves the equivalent purpose, except for the situations listed below. And there's a few, a few exceptions. 
So this is written in a technology agnostic way. It doesn't say anything about HTML or do's and don'ts, you know, within your code or in a design. It just says that anything that's not text, that's content, and is shown to the user has to have a text alternative, and it has to be an equivalent purpose. Okay, so what this translates to is this is the uh, common understanding that images need alt text, right? So most people have heard of accessibility. That's the first thing they think of. Images need alt text. That's what this success criterion is for specifically. And one of the techniques that if you go down that page and read about all the ways you can meet this one, using alt attributes on image elements in HTML is one way to do that. There's, there's numerous other ways to meet it as well. So that's how WCAG success criteria work. So WCAG's been in development for, as I mentioned, over 20 years. The version 2.0, the major last major release, was published in 2008. In 2018, 2.1 was released. And just this past October, 2.2 was released. These all build on one another. So each minor version adds a few new success criteria that need to be met. And it's really a response to technology trends such as mobile and uh, other, other things that have developed in the last 12 to 15 years. So they're cumulative and we're on version 2.2 now and that is the one to be looking at. So what laws and policies are out there that require us to be accessible and how do those relate to WCAG? So the most important one is United in the United States is ADA Title III. It's part of the Americans with Disabilities Act that was passed in 1990. It's a federal law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in the activities of places of public accommodations. So what that means is if your business or organization is open to the public, open to everyone, you can't discriminate uh, against someone because they have a disability. And it was passed in 1990. That was before the web became a thing. Since then, websites have become understood as being places of public accommodations. So if you have a retail business, you need to make sure that it's wheelchair accessible. If you have a website for your retail business, it needs to be accessible to people with disabilities as well. And it's the basis for legal action in web accessibility cases, ADA Title III. Section 508, you may have heard of, that's, that's used a lot. Section 508 is a part of the Rehabilitation Act. Actually, it was passed in 1973, so even earlier. What this did was it was a federal law mandating that all electronic and inf information technology developed, procured, maintained, or used by the federal government must be accessible to people with disabilities. So it was for the federal government only. And that was, that was expanded from just the internal workings of the federal government to any business or organization that works for the federal government, so contractors. We've had clients who have done software products that are procured by the federal government, and they've been very Section 508 obsessed about getting that right because it was a requirement. How this relates to the rest of the world, the non-governmental world, is that Section 508 at one point included a list of requirements for something to be considered accessible, uh, a, a website or piece of software. So that was used in, in ex web accessibility lawsuits as the things that the website needed to do in order to be considered accessible. So that's how it relates to other non-governmental um, web issues. In 2017, Section 508 was updated, and it now points to WCAG 2.0 AA as the standard, as the new list of requirements. So basically, everything points to WCAG. If you understand WCAG, you're meeting WCAG, you're considered accessible. It's also referenced around the world, outside the United States. Many other countries either directly reference a, a version of WCAG or incorporate many of the same success criteria into their own laws. So WCAG is the way to go. So how would you test a website to uh, see if it's accessible and point you in the direction of being able to uh, correct things that are not 
uh, that are not accessible. There's a few tools that you can that are free that you can install um, and get some information about a website. One is called Wave. This one I like because you can install it as an extension in your browser. There's also a, a URL of a website you can go to to do the same thing. You run it, it gives you a visually augmented view of your web page with lots of icons that appear next to things that are errors or alerts, things you might want to look at more closely, um, just revealing the structural information of the page so you can get a view under the hood, like all the headings on the page, like what level are they, making sure that you're using headings properly. So it gives you kind of a more visual window into what's going on uh, in the code behind the scenes. There's another one called Axe. This can be installed as, a, as an extension in Chrome and run on a page to get a report. It's also available as a tool that developers can um, put into their workflow that can run automated tests on code that's being committed. So you can get, be flagged of any potential problems in your development work as you're developing. Uh, so Axe is another one. This one is a paid service called Site Improve. A lot of our clients subscribe to this uh, when we launch their websites to monitor uh, the website. It does more than accessibility. It looks for broken links and uh, badly written copy typos, that sort of thing. Um, but it also does its own set of accessibility uh, checks on across the website, not just on a single page, but across the entire website. The so Site Improve is an option. The challenge with these tools is that 70 to 80% of accessibility flaws um, cannot be automatically detected or are not detected by these tools. And the reason for that is they all they are, all they're really doing is looking, scanning the code for patterns, right? Let's look through the code and find all instances of an image tag and let's see if it has an alt attribute. And if it doesn't, we're gonna flag that as an error. Right, so it, it doesn't understand the meaning behind the the alt text that's been written for an image. If it's bad alt text, it doesn't describe the image. It's not going to know that. So unmarked headings, poor alternative text, non-descriptive links, and many others in WCAG uh, really cannot or are not sufficiently detected by automated tools. So this is where you need to have a deeper understanding of accessibility and so you can detect what will be problematic uh, on your own as you're managing your website. Um, I generally have found that most accessibility failures fall into two major buckets. A majority of them are at the code level. So development teams being really uh, versed in accessibility is critical. A lot of really, uh, severe failures occur at the code level. A little bit less, but just as big is content level accessibility failures. So entering content in a way that's marked up and structured properly uh, with descriptive text where it's needed, um, captioning videos, alt text for images, headings, lists, links, uh, lots of other things are content level issues. Design also plays a role, a smaller but crucial role in making sure that the visual presentation and the structure of the layout is also accessible. So really a lot of uh, people have a role to play in ensuring good accessibility. It's not just uh, you know, the, the QA person's job. It's not just the, the manager of, of such and such. Um, Every person has a has a vested interest, I think, in understanding accessibility and making sure that um, everything is done according to the WCAG standard. So, um, just to uh, mention, you know, if you are if you're able to really do try to uh, access the screen reader on your device and see what it's like to test with a screen reader, it's every device has one. Turn it on, get to know, uh, listen to what it's saying. That's another way of testing your website. You can just turn on a screen reader and move from element to element down the page and see if it's describing things in a way that makes sense. So there's a lot more to say about that. I don't have time to get into it, but um, a screen reader is for people who test for accessibility, such as me, it's our primary tool for revealing failures.
So running a quick scan, looking at a report, that's like step one, going through every page top to bottom, using a keyboard, opening and closing things, like listening to what each element is, like you're revealing lots of information about the, the accessible name of the element, the role that it's playing on the page, what state it's in, is it open, closed, selected, unselected? There's lots of things that need to be present at the code level, at the content level, at the design level that will be evident when using a screen reader. So, so yeah, check it out. Um, if you ever have a chance to uh, watch a person who has a, a visual disability or another uh, such disability, it's really revealing to see how people who are accustomed to, to not having a certain ability will adapt and actually be able to more efficiently use interfaces than maybe somebody like me who has, uh, who's fully sighted. So um, this particular person who we, we uh, got to witness trying to use an interface was so fast at jumping around a page using search a lot, right? To, to find things on a page and, and quickly click things and move that it was like almost hard to keep up with what was what was happening. He had a screen reader um, speaking rate turned way up. So it was like a hyperspeed kind of like uh, speaking rate, doing search on the page, you know, pulling up a list of all the headings, jumping to the heading he wanted to go to, clicking a link by pressing enter, he's onto a new page. You know, people who are accustomed to using assistive technology and who have a disability actually are almost like power users. <laughs> So it's really interesting. So um, just to kind of bring this all back to the, the human side of this, I wanted to leave you with a, just a quick quote, a moment. So Hadley was a project we worked on. And what Hadley is, it's a, it's a place for older adults who are losing their vision to learn, connect, and thrive. So it's an online learning platform we created with Hadley that um, among other things, gave users a chance to experience workshops, which are like short videos that are tips and tricks on how to do life if you're losing your vision. So what we found was that older adults who are, you know, many of whom are, you know, had full sight capabilities their entire life and who are now finding life very difficult because their vision is deteriorating. They may have just gotten a diagnosis from their doctor they don't think of themselves as being disabled. They don't think of themselves as having a need for accessibility. They might not even know what that term means. So, you know, we tend to think of accessibility, disabilities as being a certain kind of category of people who have a disability and know that and have special needs. You know, adults who are going up in years and losing their sight often are very fearful and lack confidence and don't realize that there's many others out there who are like them. And so we created a space for them to discover content, learn about how to do life more easily with their with their condition, connect with others and feel a sense of joy that that doors aren't closing to them necessarily in life. They can still thrive. And um, we launched this site and it's, they've had a huge increase in signups uh, by people who are discovering Hadley. And they've been getting these letters from users just overjoyed at what they've discovered with Hadley. And this is just one of the quotes that, that somebody just sent to Hadley. You know, I could not believe it. Every topic I was concerned about was right there before my ears. So somebody who has, didn't realize that they could still do all the things they loved doing, Hadley showed them that, yes, these things are still possible. You need to adapt and use different strategies, different techniques, but it's all there and the person could just use their ears to listen to the content and they got what they needed and they felt they felt like they were seen as a person. So that really is the ultimate goal for all of this is to make sure that people, make sure they have an experience that says, you get me, you understand me, this, is, this was made for me. Um, and really that, that's, that's the ultimate goal for, for me. So that's what I have and um, would love, if anyone has questions, happy to speak to those. Jeremy, that was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. That was, I've heard bits and pieces of this um, presentation before, but that's a great refresher. And I was taking screen grabs of the, um, 
the different programs we can use. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions or any um, personal insights or experience with this? Let's see, I can't see if I see. Oh, yep, Julie, I see you. Go ahead. Um, I have a question about um, people who may live with seizures. Um, when you're building websites and you might animate um, certain graphics or videos or things that might bounce around the screen and pop up in and out and slide in and roll down. And is, is there any thought as to, um, is there a way to not have that kind of animation for those people who live with seizures that might trigger a seizure when they're seeing those kinds of things? Yep. So there are uh, two specific WCAG criteria that address that, that, that must be met. One of them is called the three flashes and below. And there's a threshold for you can't present, you can never present information that flashes, I believe it's more than three times per second. Uh, it must be higher than that because that's the threshold at which, you know, it could trigger seizures. So that's a that's a believe I believe a level A criterion. So it's must have. There's also another one that's about controlling movement or motion on a screen. So for any basically it says any continuous movement more than five seconds must be able to be paused, stopped, or hidden by the user. So that's that includes things such as sort of background videos that are just run automatically, auto rotating carousels anything that's automatically updating on a page in a loop, um, animated GIF images that don't, that are longer than five seconds. I always advise clients, be careful about putting those on your page. And that that's where it could slip in by somebody who doesn't know that, but has access to editing content on a site, could add an animated GIF. So that, that, that allows somebody that gets, that can't focus because there's movement on the screen to stop all of that that motion so that they can focus. So those are the two that relate to uh, movement in particular and, and, and seizures, as you mentioned. Thank you. Jeremy, I had a question. The, uh, in your windows of, of um, your circles of what the most important thing is like the coding and then the content, but then the design is kind of a smaller circle in your diagram, um, when we design sites and everything you kind of showed had a lot of people that are using a lot of assistant technologies to do screen readers and this and that. So what, like, at what point do you design for those people? I mean, like, what, you know what I mean? Like, is like, are we designing for people with vision or are we designing, like, is it, what subset are people that actually see the site? That's, I'm just curious. Yeah, so the um, great question. Um, the way the way I think about it, and what we try to do at iFactory is that we design something that will work for everyone as much as possible. So there are certain thresholds that you can't cross before you are in the territory of like it's going to be harder, to exceptionally hard for somebody who's low vision, for example. So that's where contrast ratios come into play. So when we're designing a web page, we make sure that all text has a minimum contrast ratio of 4.5 to 1. And there are tools that can measure the difference between two colors and, and whether they meet that ratio or not. So our team is always checking that as we're creating interfaces. So like I said, yellow text on a white background is going to be far below that threshold. Uh, Dark orange text on a white background might just be enough, but it tends to look brown. Using orange and yellow for text is usually something we stay away from. We look for ways to include the orange in other ways in the design that are not text. So there's that sort of thing. There's also like when you're designing like an infographic, don't use color alone to distinguish information. Like look at this graph. The red dots indicate one thing, the blue dots indicate another thing, because if you're colorblind, you can't tell the difference between the red and the blue. So that would be, you would be include uh, something such as different shapes, like the blue squares and the red circles. So that shape and color are coming into play or using text labels or patterns or other types of 
So there are way there are ways to just dovetail through and create something that is the most flexible and works for the most people while still looking stunning and branded and imaginative and all the things that we like to do as marketing professionals. Um, so that that really is my philosophy. There's there are ways you can have an inaccessible default view and then a, an accessible alternative version that is allowed through WCAG. It's called a conforming alternative alternative version where you know click this link to go to the the, the version that is accessible. But it, it doubles the work involved to create two versions and users might not discover that link to the accessible version. So you're already starting to potentially introduce barriers. It's better to just create one solution that stays within certain thresholds to be accessible. Great, thank you. Yep. Wayne, yeah, Wayne, over to you. Yeah, so um, the question with accessibility, um, how helpful are tools such as UserWay, um, software that you implement into a website to help with accessibility? Yeah, um, we, we see that a lot. Um, sites so so user way and other tools like it are third party services where you can embed a widget on your website it's typically like a little tab or an icon that floats in the corner that's like the accessibility icon and you click it and it gives you a panel of settings that you can change like make this high contrast or underline all the links or show me all the you know show me different levels of info on the page enlarge the text, lots of other things. So those are helpful as a stopgap. That's my view. While you are remediating the, the website to just be accessible out of the out of the box. These the third party tools like the scanning, automated scanning tools I mentioned, are limited in that all they're doing is looking for patterns on this on the web page and trying to make guesses about what what things should be. It's supplementing what's there by just looking for patterns. It doesn't understand the meaning behind the elements that are there. And so it misses stuff. I see them all the time where um, you, could, you could use the high contrast mode and certain elements completely disappear because of the way the style sheet was written. It just doesn't didn't pick up that element. And so it could make the experience worse in some ways, some of the settings. So really just foundationally doing things the right way from the beginning um, is is superior to using a tool like that. But if you are if you have a large sprawling website and you're not ready to redesign yet or you don't have the budget to or what your limited staff, that is a way to generally improve the experience right away um, to, but it, it's not a permanent solution in my view. Great, right, thanks. Chris, I thought I saw your hand up, but I, did you have a question? I always find a question to ask. I think I was going to find but I, so I'll, I'll ask one. And that is um, in, in our experience, Jeremy, what do we see as the, the primary culprits normally when we'll go and audit somebody's site? Yeah. So the biggest things, so there, there's different ways of thinking about that. There's the most serious problems that you might find. And then there's the one, the problems that are the most pervasive or have the largest number of instances. Lack of headings seems to be a, a recurring problem I see um, or incorrect heading levels. So headings on a page are super important for somebody to get a, a mental outline of the structure of the page. So imagine you can't see a web page. You can't see that this text is bigger than this text. Oh, so it must be a heading. Think of it like just purely like an outline with indents for each section or subsection. So using headings properly, starting with H1 for the page title, H2 for all the main sections, H3 for subsections is is something that I see not being done properly a lot because like different edit different editors, different CMSs will let you choose sizes that you like the look of that don't necessarily result in a proper heading under the hood. So you end up like with text that looks big, but it's not using a heading. So that's, that's a big one. Um, the visual focus indicator is another one. 
that I see fail a lot. So when you're using a keyboard on a web page and you're moving focus from element to element, as I mentioned, you need to be able to see what element is in focus. So there are sighted keyboard users. So they're not, they aren't people who are blind. They just can't use a, a pointing device because of tremors or dexterity issues. So they use a keyboard, but they can see the screen. And in order to do that, you need to be able to clearly tell which element is in focus at any one time. And so typically there's an outline around it. Um, the browser provides a default outline, but oftentimes style reset style sheets will turn that off. So web pages will have no outline at all. And so it's impossible to see like where it focuses. So that's another one that I see, or it's low contrast. If there's a custom style for it, it's very light or it can't be seen. So that's something that I see a lot. Um, and then there's also like things like images and videos without correct text or captions, like uncaptioned videos is a big, big one as well. Um, so yeah, those those are like the, the big ones that I always look for when I'm assessing a, a site to see like where it stands as far as quality. We do have a few minutes left. Does anyone have any other questions? You can either use your hand, like your physical hand, or you can do the hand on uh, Zoom here. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, in terms of the legality of all of this, is there like a threshold at which um, somebody's website would be subject to the the legal accessibility issues? Like, is Joe's Pizza Shop dot com gonna ha gonna be having to do the same thing as like a, a university? Great question. Yeah. So technically, under the law, they're both entities are equally need held to the same standard. Um, they must be accessible if they're accommodating the public. There are, I'm not a legal expert, so I can't go into the, the nuances of it. If the website is not, is a minor part of your operation, maybe it could, could, be, could be considered not a, a significant part of your service. Maybe that would be taken into account. We do, so a lot of our clients are publicly funded colleges and universities they are held to a very stringent standard. It's still WCAG as the list of things that you need to do, but there's a lot riding on being remaining accessible um, and keeping keeping track of not falling out of compliance um, because they're they're federal they're federally and state funded um, taxpayer money. There's there's additional scrutiny. Um, so yeah, that it's a uh, those those are two differences that I can think of. Fantastic. Jeremy, this was super informative. Um, as those of you who were on right at the beginning, you know that we have recorded this, so we will be able to distribute this if um, anyone is interested. And I just wanted to thank all of you, especially you, Jeremy, for taking the time to help educate us on this. And I appreciate all of you taking some time out of your lunch hour to be with us. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Great job, Jeremy. Great job, Jeremy. All right. Thanks, all. All right.